Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, we are very delighted to have everyone back here and um, to start our CLE credited uh, part of the afternoon. Um, and uh, we're we couldn't have thought of a better panel to kick off this afternoon. Um, but I would like to introduce first the moderator for our panel, which is our editor-in-chief-elect for next year's volume of IJLSC, Liam Williams. Hello, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I get the joy of introducing our panelists today on our far your left, I almost said my right. Um, we have Steve, is it Rocco? Yes. It is Steve Rocco, who's a lecturer at the Kelly School of Business. Next to him, we have Lisa Amgren, who is a... Amsler. Am oh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Lisa Amsler, who is associated with the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at IU Bloomington. Next to her, we have Beatrice Batero Arcila good thing I pronounced that correctly, who we just heard from upstairs. And she is an SJD candidate um, and associated with the Berkman Klein uh, Fellowship at Harvard University. And then next to her, we have someone that we're all familiar with from last night, Abby Stemler, who is a member of the, um, who is an assistant professor of business law and ethics at the Kelly School of Business. Um, so those are our basic introductions, and I'm going to start by having Steve Rocco start us off, and he's going to be talking about, if I recall this correctly, the data commons and its relationship with public policy and the sharing economy. So I'll let you Thank start off. Thank you very off. much, Liam. Well, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, very good. Well, first of all, I want to thank my distinguished panelists and thank Abby for inviting me on this panel. I really respect everybody's work on this panel. It's really exciting to, to be here. So I'm going to be talking about a, a concept that I am in, the progr in progress uh, developing for a book that will be forthcoming called The Gig Economy, Workers and Media in the Age of Convergence. And I approach the question of a data commons uh, by thinking really, you know, building off of the work of, of obviously, uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work. Um, but I'm really thinking about this in terms of, you know, the theme of this panel, market failures. Um, I am particularly distressed looking at where things are going in the gig economy and specifically looking at the problems that are posed that we may potentially anticipate with the further development of the Internet of Things and also looking at the kind of big tech dominance of digital markets and specifically thinking about the ways in which these markets have become increasingly centralized and monopolized. So, for instance, I'm thinking about the problems that have been uh, posed by Amazon, not only managing a digital market but also participating in it and leveraging the data that it collects on that platform to then basically undercut competitors to its products that it's actually issuing on the market, right? Uh, to me, this presents kind of unique problems that aren't necessarily unprecedented in the history of American capitalism, but nonetheless present new challenges that we need to begin to imagine uh, reforms in terms of. Uh, the chapter really focuses primarily on the question of Uber. Um, I'm not going to talk about Uber because I imagine that's going to come up heavily in the next panel. Of course, we had an excellent presentation on um, Uber and the question of independent contracting uh, with regard to the gig economy. That's really where I'm kind of thinking about uh, with this chapter, but I'll kind of you know, suspend that for, for what's going to come later after this panel. Um, and so just to kind of clarify some of the kind of people that I have in mind when I'm thinking about this problem of market failure just to begin with, uh, I'm thinking about Tim Wu. I'm sure a legal scholar many of you are very familiar with in his work on, on uh, antitrust that he's been publishing of late. And I also think about uh, political economists like Victor Meyer Schoenberger and Nick Snurzak. So Schoenberger, for instance, has actually argued that uh, the problem is getting so bad that he's even said that, you know, what we're seeing in the case of like Amazon, for instance, or Facebook or Google or even Apple uh, is really a reemergence of central planning in a kind of capitalist means. Um, so this is kind of where, where I'm arriving at this, at this question. And I think that there's a lot of ways in which we can begin to ref, you know, think about what reform to this particular market failure might look like. Um, and what I want to propose is a normative model 
kind of a theoretical model. I don't really have any empirical examples to draw on, so if you have any empirical examples, please let me know. Uh, I'd love to be able to assemble them towards some kind of an a kind of a variant ideal type of what a data commons can look like. But I'm, I'm really kind of working through this in a very highly theoretical way. And um, so just to kind of give you some background on what a commons is. Uh, so, you know, Ulstrom was, was instrumental in really presenting this as a criti very critical concept in heterodox economic thought. It's a commons is something that kind of transcends the matrix of a state and a market. It's something in between. Um, and a commons is really kind of more of a, a cooperative social arrangement beyond these kind of traditional uh, kind of modern institutional matrices. And it refers to a, a resource that's shared but then subject to kind of social dilemmas and vulnerabilities, right? So hence the tragedy of the commons, right? Commons are resources that are constantly under threat from enclosure, right? The way in which a common resource can be then kind of privatized and, and broken up into little like units that can be sold and commodified in markets. Um, and they're also subject to overuse. And when I think about the commons in this context of data, I'm really thinking about the, 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 the unprecedented ways in which data is being produced and collected and stored through the electromagnetic spectrum via the internet. Um, this presents a kind of new opportunity for us to really not only understand kind of the larger problems underlying kind of the human condition, right? I mean, we have an unprecedented ability to track, measure, and store information and even quantify phenomena that we haven't been able to in, in history, right? It presents enormous opportunities. The problem, though, is that this data is being hoarded. And I think that that presents a unique kind of collective action problem that a commons may be able to try to solve, or at least be part of a solution. I'm not seeing, I'm not understanding this as sort of like a silver bullet or some kind of like instrumental means to some kind of utopian end. Uh, I don't think I'm that naive, but the commons does present some kind of an alternative arrangement for how we can understand data and our relationship to data and our relationship really to also, you know, large scale kind of corporate enterprises or even non, you know, other kinds of non-corporate enterprises like states that, that are generating data and storing it for, for various purposes. And I think that when we look about like net neutrality, when we think about the ways in which um, user agreements are, are kind of consolidating data through what Facebook, Amazon, um, Uber, or all the kind of apps that we use, and the fact that they're hoarded presents a kind of unique tragedy of the digital commons. And so what I would argue is that as we're moving forward in this kind of new era, this you know fourth industrial revolution, however we want to name this particular period that we're in, um, I think that we have to have certain sets of guidelines for how we're going to be able to arrange and create a kind of socio-technical democ uh, democracy. And what I mean by that really is to begin to think about how do we um, create and even codify in statutes participatory norms and rules that will allow users to be able to direct how the data that is collected on them is used, right? In other words, I want to create some kind of a participatory means by which users who are then using device networks, right, upon which all this data is collected, can actually direct the value added in the ways that they want to. Not entirely, but with, there needs to be some kind of capacity for that. Right? Uh, because data is critical to the way capital is being formed in this era. Right? And that shouldn't just be consolidated into like particular kind of companies and then hoarded. Um, so how exactly could this work? Well, one of the ways in which uh, arrangements of commons management can take is in the form of what's called an associational commons. And this is really what I have in mind on a national scale. Uh, Levine, uh, Paul Levine, who's a political economist who writes about associational commons, uh, argues that it, an associational commons exists when a common resource is managed through organizational and institutional mechanisms that unify diverse stakeholders towards the formation of rules and responsibilities for shared use. And one can imagine an associational, associational data commons in terms of a kind of almost like the way Hannah Arendt understood a republic of councils. So what I have in mind is sort of a, a tier of overlapping councils at the municipal, local, uh, state, even regional, or even federal level in which the device networks that are traveling geographically within these kinds of jurisdictions, right, these jurisdictional maps, would begin to be able to collect data and then to store it for public use, right? So um, there's a lot of different people who are kind of proposing things along these lines. Uh, I'd highly recommend 
uh, that anybody who isn't in familiar with the book Pax Tecana by Howard, uh, Philip Howard, I would highly recommend that. This is a great book on the Internet of Things that I've come across in this research. Uh, and he's proposed that 10% of all data collected on device networks should actually be for public use along these lines. Uh, me and my uh, co-author, Byron Craig, are arguing that it should be 25%. And the idea here is that within these device networks, we collect data and that this data then becomes kind of randomly shared with these different councils on different levels and then managed at the level of councils, right? I, there's a lot of different methods for how this could be kind of representationally uh, configured. It could be through election. It could be appointment. I'm not exactly sure what the best arrangement is, but in a theoretical sense, this is what I, I see could happen. Um, there are two pillars that would also have to accompany this kind of council, this overlapping system of councils, and that would be rules for data sharing, and that would also have to be uh, uh, rules for how in which you know, or, um, industries that you know, systematically extract data would then have to share it. Uh, so, for instance, in the, there's kind of two prongs to this. On the one hand, there'd have to be a data sharing mandate for you know, companies like Amazon or Facebook or any kind of organizations that are systematically collecting data. <coughs> Right? There should be some kind of a, a mandate for them to be able to share it. Uh, and then we can also create different kind of licensing fees so that the commons would be you know, financially supported through these kinds of means. Um, I also believe that, again, like I mentioned before, that users should have the capacity to be able to share the data that's collected on them with whom they want to. Right? So we can have you know, ways in which you know, if, we, if we want to be able to contribute to developing technologies that you – know, get rid of our carbon footprint or, you know, for health purposes or for any other kinds of, you know, big collective action problems that the data collected can serve as a kind of instrumental means for solving these problems, that we should be able to direct that. It shouldn't just be, like, controlled by the companies that produce the devices themselves. Uh, they shouldn't have a monopoly on that. There should be kind of a, a participatory means along those lines. Um, I also think that Part of this system should also be uh, built into different taxes, right? There should be taxes on these device networks. Um, a lot of the industries that systematically uh, mine our data are also notorious for, you know, taking advantage of tax havens. Think about the financial sector. Think about um, big tech, for instance. So if we are able to tax device networks and to tax the way in which this value is accrued, um, little taxes could actually support this kind of larger uh, data commons at large. And I think that there also should be taxes on the sale of data to third parties, right? Some, a portion of these sales should also go back to the data commons. Um, and this could be, again, arranged in this federal system by municipal, state, regional, uh, and, and national levels. And I think taken together, a data commons offers some kind of important developments that can at least be, you know, stepping stones towards kind of reforming the larger problems that we're seeing in this particular era. First, it would ensure that the large quantities of data that's collected are not underused. I mean, this is a serious problem. I mean, there's all sorts of data that's collected, but there's all sorts of people that can use the data that don't have access to it because of the expense or the kind of hoarding that we see. Second, making data public uh, a public good would likely spark more innovations as more firms and people use it. So I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, the scholar Eric von Himpel, who's documented that technological innovations are often created by users and not by lead producers. All right, so we would enhance that. Third, uh, through the increased use of, of a multitude of different contexts and applications for how data is used, we're going to get new feedbacks. We're going to get more enriched data from the use of data. Right? So we're adding more uh, kind of collective knowledge of how this data can be understood and then finding new ways of using the data in productive ways. Uh, and then finally, as more and more firms and organizations use the data and then hence enlist and participate in this data commons, we're going to get more and more uh, enriched data contributed to the commons itself. So the commons itself becomes enriched through more use. I mean, you can kind of see network effects in the way in which, say, you know, a platform like Facebook or Google or Amazon is able to take advantage of. We imagine network effects for a larger data commons that we're all uh, participating in along these lines. So, again, this is very theoretical. Um, I'm curious to hear what anybody thinks. Um, I'm curious to hear of any kind of empirical examples I can look at to kind of further this research. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you for that, and that was a very like, expansive and very open way to look at data usage, but now we're going to look at a bit what it looks like in the real world at the moment, which is a bit less uh, open and freely accessed. Lisa Amser is going to talk to us a bit about uh, adhesive arbitration clauses in the context of consumer employment or independent contractor online systems.
Yes. So I'll let you well, take it away. I start from the general to the specific. So first of all, I want to thank you very much all for everything I've heard today, for being here. I was a labor lawyer for 10 years, first for unions as a law student and then for management in the public sector in what is now the biggest law firm in Connecticut where I was a partner before I came to Bloomington. And it, it just warms my heart to be with people who care about employee rights, um, which is, you know, increasingly few of us. So what I'd like to do is move from the general to the specific. One of my former partners came to a talk of mine and said it was like being with somebody in a traffic helicopter. Given all the talk about transportation today, I'd like to take us up into the traffic helicopter. So think about the policy continuum, right? We've got upstream, we're making policy, legislative branch. Midstream, we're implementing policy, executive branch. Downstream, we're enforcing it, which is where most law students live in the judicial branch. And I, I want to build on the introduction to Eleanor Ostrom. You need to learn how to analyze the context in which you are going to be working. Uh, so Eleanor can help you with the institutional analysis and development framework. I want to give you that in 30 seconds because it's what frames a book that my co-authors and I have coming out from Stanford University Press on dispute system design. It's coming out in May. And uh, Eleanor's work shaped the whole book. So she tells us there are action arenas. They're nested, just like Steve said. Let's just think about it in the domestic US, federal, state, and local, right? And then there are also organizations, and we've got all these institutions online that we've been dealing with uh, all morning. Well, within any action arena, we've got participants, their positions, potential outcomes, action outcome linkages. Remember the word arbitration. We'll come back to that. Control, or lack thereof, by the participants. Types of information generated and access to that information, costs and benefits assigned to different actions and outcomes. These are things that you can use to analyze any arena of law you're going to practice in, oh, law students in this room. Um, so the key thing that Eleanor says that's most relevant to me as a lawyer is there are these exogenous, independent, external variables, rules, rules on paper, rules in use, who has control over the rules? Because whoever has control over the rules is going to shape what can happen in the action arena, right? So let's talk about that for a minute. Think about the days of the New Deal. There was a tremendous reshaping of the rules. You had Roosevelt and the New Deal Congress in control of shaping those rules. And after Roosevelt threatened court packing and one vote on the Supreme Court flipped, we had the Supreme Court acquiescing in the changes in the rules that we saw, which is where we get labor law. Now, after World War II, we had Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics, and then later who became Justice Powell and the US Chamber of Commerce wanting collectively to change the basis upon which policy was made, to change the rules, and together they succeeded. I mean, think about the Reagan administration. Um, think about the majority on the Supreme Court now. The kinds of cases that come out of that school of thought, and if you're interested in the history of that school of thought, you might just one quick chapter in Francis Moore LaPay, and yes, she did write Diet for a Small Planet, but she also wrote more recently Daring Democracy. She'll be here April 3rd to get an honorary degree. She'll be here the week after the election for a whole week as a patent lecturer. Don't miss it. Um, she, she writes about this history, but the results are things like the Supreme Court and the Gilmer case, which says to us for the first time that the FAA applies to employment and consumer arbitration. Uh, and suddenly, who's got control, right? Now all of a sudden, all these large corporate entities have the power to shape how people can enforce the rule of law. And under the Federal Arbitration Act, you can't overturn an arbitration award 
that commits an error of law. So it's okay to have a mass of arbitration awards that are wrong as a matter of law that are the only way of enforcing all of the employment statutes that we saw listed before lunch and arenas of law that are supposed to be conferring employees' rights. Um, so I'll come back to that example. But second, second Supreme Court case, and again, our branches of government, uh, Citizens United completely changed the rules and control over the rules for money in politics. It's reshaped our politics. So right now we've got big money controlling the rules. Congress, another on the policy continuum. Gillens and his co-authors at Princeton in political science have published a number of articles that establish empirically that there is a perfect linear relationship between what the Tom top 10% economically want Congress to do as a matter of policy and what gets done, whether it's a Democratic Party majority or Republican Party in majority. It's money that's driving policy making in Congress. Um, so results of this, and these are all, uh, not all of them, most of them are downstream, but uh, they have upstream implications. So mandatory adhesive arbitration and where it's come in the last uh, 30 years, I was the first person to publish an empirical article on the repeat player effect and the possibility that there is bias uh, being implemented in these designs of adhesive arbitration systems. And uh, there's a consistent, the data's been replicated for the last 20 years. There's a cottage industry at Cornell, five professors replicating it like crazy. Um, so I'll talk about adhesive arbitration very briefly, dark money in politics very briefly. ALEC and hyper preemption, preemptions come up today. State laws being made to preempt local ordinances. Come back to that. And what nobody's talking about is investment treaty arbitration and what's happening globally. Um, although there has been some mention of global. So conflict. So we started with Ostrom, then we talked about the rule of law. Now let's talk about conflict. How do we enforce the rule of law? So adhesive arbitration effectively guts enforcement of public law. If an arbitration award can't be overturned for an error of law, and if employees and consumers are forced to arbitrate, we have no meaningful enforcement of public law. There is no precedent being set. They're private and confidential. Um, so you can't even document how they're violating uh, public law. So the um, examples uh, downstream, we now have every online relationship, people are clicking accept without looking at what's in the um, agreement and most of the time there's an arbitration clause for consumers. It's uh, suppressing claiming, look at the work of Robert Reich, David Wheel's book, Fisher's Workplace is brilliant. He was the head of the Fair Labor Standards uh, Wage Enforcement Division under Obama and there is no wage enforcement um, because these cases can't be brought. They're subject to arbitration clauses. Um, Galanter has done empirical work on what's happened uh, in, the, in the federal court caseload and basically the arbitration clauses and that change in the law in Gilmer the intention was to get all the civil rights courses, uh, cases out of the, the federal courts, and it's worked. Now the federal court docket is dominated by the Fortune 1000. So we're paying for it, they're using it. Um, new, suppressing new case precedent uh, and limits on enforcement. Okay, let's talk about for a minute hyper preemption. Um, this is upstream. This is in lawmaking. And uh, ALEC, the American Legal Enterprise Council, related to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, on the same page, what they do is they bring families of newly elected Republican state legislators to expensive resorts, they hand them model legislation, and they ask them to go pass it at the state level. The model legislation prohibits local government from passing ordinances that regulate things. So a couple of examples. Um, Bloomington can't ban single-use plastic bags. What would the state care about our use or banning thereof of single-use plastic bags? Um, fracking, Colorado, counties can't ban fracking. It's possible that the minimum wage law, the Fair Labor Standards Act actually sets a floor, not a ceiling. 
but the states are the ones that can make a higher minimum wage. So those cities that are passing living wage or higher minimum wages could be at risk depending on state law. Um, councils can't create communities, municipalities can't create utilities for high-speed internet because in Tennessee it's been banned by the state even though there are people in little tiny communities that have no internet access in the mountains of Appalachia. Um, ban in, in Indiana on net metering of solar uh, panels, which, because I saw it coming, I am grandfathered against. Um, ban of affordable housing unit requirements in new apartment developments in Bloomington, passed by the state legislature because we're the People's Republic of Bloomington, and we're so radical left that they have to control us, right? Um, so limit on local rules. Last example, well, I'm running out of time. That's okay. Uh, so international investment treaty arbitration. These treaties are being made without any public engagement by voters in the United States, right? which is fine because they generally are in our interest most of the time, but think about the developing world and efforts at democracy and voice in the developing world. These treaties get passed, state, uh, companies invest in a developing world state, and there's only one way to enforce them. It is investment treaty arbitration, private arbitrators. These arbitration awards preempt state and national nation state statutes. So in Mongolia, there was a leftover polluting uranium mine from Russia. And Mongolia passed an environmental statute. It lost an investment treaty arbitration. It can't enforce its environmental law because of the investment treaty clause and the arbitration award ruling against them. So that's going on. Look particularly at the work of Mariana Hernandez Crespo Gonstead, who's Venezuelan and is writing about that right now. But is at St. Thomas, she's a US citizen, and it's all of Central and South America. Fascinating work. Uh, last area that I want you to think about is innovation. Um, so we've got the, tr the arbitration clauses, but you'd think innovation can be a good thing, and it can be a good thing. Online dispute resolution can be great. Um, eBay has done great things, but it's also scary. I mean, it's online mediation, online arbitration. But there's data analysis being done by, uh, has been done for the last decade by uh, Jean Brett at the Kellogg School of Business and her co-authors. They have incorporated AI. This is, this is dispute resolution, not between the employee and the employer or the independent contractor and the hiring company or between consumers and um, the company that sells them stuff. It is buyer and seller on eBay with eBay controlling the dispute mechanism between the buyer and seller. And they're using AI so that when the, sell, when the buyer files a complaint, it gets translated into different English so that the seller can hear it without losing face and taking offense so that there's more likely to be a settlement, which is binding on both parties because of the click accept that you did with eBay. And you don't even know that AI is translating your complaint. I don't know if you care when you buy on eBay, but it's happening. So how can we push back? Pushback is happening. We had some talk about um, all the complaint filings. Um, are you in the audience? The last talk before lunch. Uh, it, all the complaint filings against Uber, um, 200 and some odd complaint filings in an agency. We also have Uber uh, and DoorDash uh, drivers or delivery people filing individual arbitration claims because these adhesive arbitration clauses prohibit class arbitration and class actions. But if you get 2,600 drivers to file individual arbitration claims, the lawyer fees for Uber or DoorDash go through the roof. And so they're trying to actually get out from under their arbitration clauses. So there is, a, there is pushback. Um, and I think I'll stop there. It's massive market failure. There's no meaningful regulation on the downstream quasi-judicial and judicial end of things. And thank you for doing that general introduction at the beginning. We can clap if that's appropriate if people are doing it. <laughs>
I think it was important to do that general overview at the beginning, looking at the interaction between different levels of law, because that's something we've been discussing today, how local is being preempted by the state level and how there's a kind of a fight going on about who gets to actually regulate some of these industries and some of these businesses. And now we're going to hear from um, Beatrice about data sharing ordinances in local government and how they're trying to address some of these negative externalities. Um, thanks, Liam. Yeah, I also want to thank um, Abby and Ben and Liam and uh, everyone at the journal for inviting me. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here and it's been a very exciting conversation so far. Um, so I actually did talk a little already about data sharing and local government, so I'm going to pick it up from there. So for those of you who weren't at the launch, uh, which might be many, um, one, of the, one of the ways we're seeing local governments trying to curb many of the negative externalities that the sharing economy generates locally is to ask these companies for some of the information that they collect. Um, typically, I, these are part of licensing requirements, so to, to get a permit to operate a scooter company or so on. There is a data sharing requirement, and, and the and local governments use this information for a variety of, of things. So they use it to uh, plan for better streets, so they know where people are taking a shortcut through the park, and they design a bike lane that way. They also, they've, they've also used it to um, create minimum, kind of minimum wages for gig workers, so they know how, so New York City uh, monitors how much are Uber drivers driving, and based on it enacted some minimum pays uh, ordinances and and that's actually been great um, because gig workers typically make below a living wage. Um, there's it's also a mechanism for um, city governments to make sure a uh, private parties are complying with short rental laws because it's it's very hard to enforce short rental. It's very hard to know whether I am renting my apartment on Airbnb or it's just my friend or my cousin who's staying. Um, so so these are. Uh, I think strategies that we're seeing that are, I think, successful and, and worth looking at to see whether it, local governments can curve some of the negative externalities. And I think something to, to look at is whether they're going to get preempted. Um, that's certainly an issue, and, and it, it's unsurprising. There was last summer um, many of the e scooter companies lobbied for a state law in New York City, in, uh, in California, to try to ban a local regulation of scooters. Uh, and particularly, like one of the items in the state law was that they that data sharing was was supposed to be preempted. That didn't go through, but like we might see it again. Um, but one of the one of the things uh, that companies raise and, and one of the th and, and privacy advocates agree with them is that there are many privacy concerns about this sort of data sharing, um, and they're legitimate. They are I think they're a little bit weaponized by companies when when they raise them. But, but it is true that I, I feel anxious about the government, local government, know, knowing where I am or where I'm going. E-scooter, for example, data is often shared a, in real time. And, and, and you could be concerned about that. You could be concerned about law enforcement, knowing how people are moving, or immigration services. But also if there's a breach, a, what if a hacker suddenly knows where I am? And well, let's not get a, too nervous about it, but, but there are privacy concerns. And, um, and I'm going to take that segue to, to talk about a privacy law because it is, it is kind of an understanding that we have an issue in the sharing economy about data and the data monopolies that uh, Steve was speaking earlier um, and uh, how, how companies are using these massive amounts of information to sort of leverage their position in the market, create monopolies, it's very hard to compete. And, and it seems like this lawless space, this data thing that's happening. But actually, we do have a body of law that addresses personal information, and it's called privacy law. So, uh, so what is happening with privacy law that is sort of enabling this malfunctioning of, well, I don't know malfunctioning, but it's enabling this sort of situation that is concerning. Um, so. One of the key things that I think uh, are being currently criticized or discussed in the scholarship is the idea of privacy self-management. And this, is, this should be very familiar to all of us, so you basically download an app or you are at an airport or whatever and you click terms of service to access the Wi-Fi, be able to order whatever the service is, uh, and you click accept and you, you get the service, you're free, but you have also consented to the collection of your data. 
And what I think is most interesting right now is that you've also consented to the downstream uses of the data. So, so I think typically consumers were, were fairly aware that we're granting the companies acts, uh, well, the right to collect the data and use it in a way that is somewhat related to the service that I, that I want to acquire. But what is increasingly happening is that there are downstream uses and ways to monetize that data. So that information is being sold for, to a variety of actors, to insurance companies, there's a data market thing, and, and there are people who, there are companies that specialize in gathering data and then rebundling it and selling it forward. And, and I think there are actually many good uses to these mark, data markets. Uh, some of them are targeted advertising that can get creepy, but in a way, I'm also happy I'm not getting advertising about, I don't know, uh, restaurants in Italy when I live in Boston, Massachusetts. Like, it works that they know who I am and they're able to tell me what sort of in my neighborhood. So that's a good, a good way of a data market working. But it also works in very concerning ways, right? So uh, we see cases in which um, data is being used by insurance companies, very sensible data to sort of set primes and that might that might raise concerns about equality. Uh, there's also, we also see law enforcement agencies buying data uh, to, I don't know, uh, uh, target, uh, well, th that's, th that's the concern, right? To target political dissenters or uh, follow them around or uh, prosecute immigrants. Um, so, so there are some, some problems in the data market. And one of the things, one of the key ideas of privacy self-management that, it, that I think is increasingly less useful for the reality of the digital economy in which we increasingly live, is that it is very hard to opt out. Uh, so one of the ideas in typically in contract law and, and, and property law is that I, I, I as an individual, I am deciding to engage in a particular economic transaction, I'm deciding to engage, but it is increasingly hard to disengage from the internet. It is very hard to disengage. I mean, my employer requires me to be on Slack and it's part of my working requirements. What if I don't wanna give Slack my data? Well, too bad. Or, or it's very hard to not uh, access Wi-Fi sometimes. Um, so, and another, and another key issue, even let's assume that I decide to opt out. Let's assume I'm one of the heroes that is not on Twitter and is not on Facebook. And I am on Twitter and I am on Facebook, but there's people, <laughs> there's those, there's, I know some, a few. Even them are on the internet, right? Because maybe I went out for dinner and we took a picture and I uploaded it. And so their picture is online too, even though they didn't consent. Or there are very interesting cases about people, for example, who did like the 23andMe uh, DNA test. And then they consented, they signed the terms, they did everything, but then the DNA revealed something about their siblings. Uh, and the siblings didn't consent, they didn't anything. So, one of the things that happens in the digital information, the digital network economy is that our information is networked, right? It, it not only speaks about us, but it speaks about with the people who are surrounding us. And privacy self-management has this very individual approach about, about data and how we sort of negotiate with it in our economic and social transactions, right? Um, so the case I want, to, um, I want to try to argue here is that I think there, there are many good values in individual agency and we shouldn't, we shouldn't completely ban uh, consumers and, and users' rights to sort of decide what's, what's, what's happening with, with their data and, and consenting, I guess. But we, we should start thinking about outlying particular data usages. And this is actually very radical, what I'm saying. So we see like this uh, CCPA in a, in California recently enacted the GDPR, in Europe, those are like the vanguard privacy laws and they all still rely on privacy self-management. The rights, the new rights we are being able to pass through Congress are about uh, being able to ask companies to delete my data or being able to move my data from one side to another. But these are all things that require my agency, my choice. And I don't know about you, but I really struggle in managing my email accounts. I have like three and it's a mess and I don't know, I don't know what type of, uh, and I think, I think there's a lot of behavioral science research about how we are just not equipped to deal with all this decision making. And, and I think, um, I think, I think, some, I think the, the conversation needs to be reframed in terms of what we mean by agency in a digital information economy. And 
we need to rescue from the law the idea that part of what law does is to restrict a, a freedom of contract and freedom of property to make us free. So, so it is not, I think it's a, it's a false dichotomy that we are restricting our freedom uh, when we choose those laws. We've actually, that's the story of law, right? So we first enacted constitutions to restrict someone's powers over others. Uh, it's the story of the 19th century in Lochner and labor law. So, so that's, a, that's, a wonderful, uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful sentence in Lochner, I think, in which it's all about freedom of contract, right? So this poor guy, he's working like, I don't remember, but like 18 hour days and everything's a mess and he's free to do so. No, he wasn't. Uh, and, and that's what, that's the, the big conquer of labor law in the early 20th century, that we recognize that he wasn't free, that we needed some restrictions to make workers free. And then we did it, we did something very similar a few years later with consumer law, right? So if I go up to Walmart or whatever and I buy a microwave, I can be absolutely certain that the microwave is not going to explode. Uh, even though I chose the microwave and they could have sold me a microwave that could explode for a cheaper price or something uh, because I valued wrongly the, the safety or the, of the device. Uh, that's not true. We, we, we created consumer law because we understood that consumers can't really make those choices and, and the way to make the market work and, and the, the, uh, is to actually make some restrictions. So, so products must be safe. Uh, and that's a restriction on my freedom of contract and it's a restriction on theirs. They could be selling I don't know, very unsafe stuff uh, for cheaper prices. Um, and I think maybe it's time for another type of limitation like that uh, in the digital information economy. We might need some limitation uh, on data law um, or privacy law uh, that sort of start protecting us users from downstream uses of our data that we, we simply can't grasp uh, and, and may actually help flourish the many good things that, um, that the sharing economy or the has uh, in, a, in a safe and controlled way that sort of doesn't create all the patterns of inequality and anxiety um, <laughs> that we see sometimes. Thank you. And it is super important to think about where your data is going, everyone. Just in case you have your phone on you, I'm sure your data is going somewhere right now. But in addition to just thinking about those side effects of data collection and where it's going in the sharing economy, it's also important to think about the foundations of the sharing economy and what actually allowed this to come to fruition in a sense. And then I'll turn it over um, and you're going to talk about um, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, I believe, and its relation to the Airbnb v. Santa Monica case. Yeah. Um, so to continue the thank yous. Thank you to the participants for dropping some knowledge on us today um, and taking the time to come in um, to help us continue the important conversation. And for the audience members, thank you also for taking the time to listen. And hopefully you'll engage in some questions and come to the reception after we'll continue even further. Um, so I've spent a lot of time in um, my research life exploring how platforms subvert regulation, right? particularly the regulations designed to address the market failures that arise when companies don't ex internalize the costs they inflict on society, in particular asymmetry of information that leads to uh, consumer protection issues. Um, so when these platform-based business models, Uber, Airbnb, come into markets, they tend to take three approaches. One, they just ignore the rules that currently exist, move fast, break things, Uber's model for a long time. Um, they find loopholes and say, we're kind of an ex exception, you know, we're a technology company, we're not a transportation company. Or they actually do get some rules crafted, um, but they craft those rules with um, kind of legislators and uh, lawmakers to just codify their existing business practices. So they use their political power to say, okay, you can make some rules for us, but how about the rules are this? All you have to have is a driver's license, a simple background check, a car with four wheels, and insurance. Okay, we already have that for all of our Uber drivers. Easy peasy. Those are good rules to have. Um, so what, um, when Platforms don't have um, regulations they really like, though. 
um, we see them taking two more approaches. So we have the three ways that they've subverted. We have, of course, loopholes, uh, just plowing right through end runs, and then crafting rules in their favor. But when actually towns and cities get the political will to directly regulate, um, these platforms typically um, either go to state lawmakers, which we've heard this theme before, where they try to get state lawmakers to quash local governments from enacting rules. That's exactly what happened in Bloomington, Indiana with Airbnb. Bloomington tried to impose some very reasonable requirements on Airbnbs, and the state said, oh no, Bloomington, you radical liberal college <laughs> town, uh, we're going to stop this. Um, and so with that jurisdiction issue, um, aside, platforms also rely on 26 words in a 1996 law called Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. How many of you have heard of it before? Okay, like four. Um, so this is the law that many claim has made the modern internet. It is what allows um, Reddit and Facebook Craigslist, whatever, to not be liable for the third-party content put on its platform. So this stemmed out of defamation law and a case where an old-fashioned bulletin board, and we're talking in the time like pre-AOL, um, where somebody defamed a company, and the platform was held liable for that defamatory content because they kind of moderated. So they were essentially viewed as like a newspaper, and so they were responsible. And lawmakers took notice. It's complicated legislative history. If you want to check out some deep, deep analysis, check out my paper on SSRN uh, from Digital to Physical. Uh, the, uh, so the situation was that lawmakers did not want platforms to be liable for defamatory content because that would require platforms to really censor free speech. It would also, um, if they went one way to really censor things, or on the extreme, they wouldn't censor things at all, and this would cause a lot of child porn to go on the internet and bad things would happen. So we got porn on one side and we've got uh, censoring speech on the other. Section 230 was designed to allow platforms to moderate without that fear of publisher liability. Okay, so that was all about defamation, right? Speech. Now, in our world today, platforms are using Section 230 as a tool to bully uh, local jurisdictions and state governments in a lot of ways to say, hey, you can't regulate us. You can't directly say what we can or cannot do because that is related to third-party behavior. That's related to our users' illegal behavior. And that argument, in my mind, is pathetic because the platforms themselves are the one, one, creating the marketplaces, and two, they are the ones profiting off of the unlawful behavior. So fortunately, courts are beginning to agree, and um, the Santa Monica v. Airbnb case, um, actually it was HomeAway v. Uh, Santa Monica, was a situation where Santa Monica was simply trying to say to Airbnb, if you take a fee for a transaction of renting somebody's home that is an illegal listing, okay, so this property does not have a license. If Airbnb takes a fee for that transaction, Airbnb will be responsible under the law and they could face a fine and all of these other consequences. Airbnb was like, no, 230 protects us. It provides us with blanket immunity. And fortunately, the Ninth Circuit um, said, no, Airbnb, that's not related at all to your behavior as a publisher, that is not related to third party content, that is related to your action to take a fee on the transaction. So on the whole, that's a good case, but in my mind, but um, for a long time, platforms have used the threat of that litigation about these 26 words to say, oh no, it's gonna be a big fight if you go against us. And so um, in my research, I have found that many lawmakers in little, little cities and towns, when Airbnb says that this federal law protects them, they really just step back and say, we can't fight you. Um, so you see newspaper reports of local uh, councilmen and women saying, you know, Airbnb says that there's this thing that protects them and our legal office has two people in it. Um, that's kind of what Bloomington is. We invited the, um, 
the city to come and have some CLEs for free. And they're like, we have two people <laughs> in our uh, legal department that could come. So uh, that is a really, another really interesting way uh, that platforms try to work around uh, regulation. And one that we often don't think about, the ways they cloak themselves in federal law to avoid um, kind of pretty basic regulation, and as Beatrice said, that we, business has always been regulated. So the fact that uh, certain platforms believe that they shouldn't be is, is quite remarkable. And I, in the Ninth Circuit oral argument, I was there, and um, Don Varelli, you know, the very famous appellate attorney, uh, was um, arguing on behalf of Airbnb, and he literally said in his argument that if you were to regulate Airbnb in this way, meaning if you were to hold Airbnb responsible if they take a fee from an unlawful lin in listing, that would destroy Airbnb's business model and crush innovation. I'm like, gosh, Don, that is ridiculous in the sense <laughs> that businesses have to comply with rules all the time. And if those rules are designed in reasonable ways to address market failures, which these licensing requirements are designed to make sure people have proper inspections of their homes and are paying appropriate fees, um, you know, that, that shouldn't be the case, so. That was actually perfect. I was about to cut you off. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may clap. So in the interest of time, I'm going to open the questions up to you all rather than you hearing my easy softballs. So if anyone has a question, we have mics around. There's a question over here. I just, I like the utopian universe that you all are imagining, and that's our job as academics to some extent, to, to think about these things. But some missing from this is how this is going to be paid for. I mean, the reason I just sat here and Googled something without even thinking about it, it was free. The reason it was free is because they're taking my data and, se and, and selling it, obviously. If we start depriving the companies of their ability to make money off this, what will happen to these very platforms that we have come to depend on, and how do we begin to address the, the economics of, of the shifting model? And I agree in theory completely with it, but I worry about how, that, that how we pay for it. And how I, mean, I remember back, I'm old enough to remember back when we had to pay for cell phone calls by the call. Right. I, I, don't think, um, I don't think we want to deprive them from um, the ability to make money out of data collection. Uh, I think many of my colleagues would kill me for that statement, but I, I, I stand by it. I think in, in my presentation, I think on the one hand, these companies are ridiculously profitable, like they have they they make a lot a lot of money so I don't I don't know if you know the numbers but it's like they make um, thirty percent of they grow thirty percent a year or, or something like that if they grow ten percent less fifteen percent less that's still pretty good like they'll be fine uh, and then of course there there might be space for uh, uh, thinking through uh, exactly how we want to uh, limit their their money making I guess. But uh, I, think, I think we definitely should want to first make sure they comply with a bunch of reasonable regulations, which they don't. I think, I think these platforms are slowly uh, changing their strategy, especially after the Ninth Circuit ruling, in which they, they seem, the message, I think, and, and that this is, this is certainly a case internationally, the message is that local regulators and state regulators are gonna fight back. The, the disruption era might have come to, a, to an end a little, and I think what I what I was saying that I think we should start to outlaw regarding the data market is our particularly harmful uses. So it's not it's not a targeted advertising that I'm worried about. I'm worried about my locational information to make it to a law enforcement without a warrant. Like why? It's there in the constitution, um, or to make it to a immigration agencies a, without me being a suspect of anything. Um, it's about my, um, I don't know, if, if, I, if I go to a pub 
four nights a week, for example. I don't want my insurance company to know that. Uh, even if I'm just drinking iced tea or not, like who cares? That's, that seem to be particularly harmful uses of information that I think we should be thinking about outlawing. Uh, but this isn't, this isn't the whole data market. It's just a little bit. And we should, I, I don't think we should be too worried about it. They're not, they'll be fine. Sure, but I, I guess I, I, okay. I don't know if I would agree with the framing of the question that you just posed. Because I guess to what extent could we then say as a public we're deprived of tax dollars to the extent that these companies use tax havens, right? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to be like like um, confrontational. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, I, I think that given that most of these platforms are, in effect, monopolies, it's hard to really kind of speculate on what the cost is going to be once we start implementing some of these changes. Uh, and I think part of uh, what could be part of the data commons, as I tried to map it out, is there's no reason – okay, so in the second panel this, this morning, uh, we had somebody up here who was talking about, gosh, from the city of Bloomington, God, if I had three engineers, I could come up with my own, like, city-based Uber app. Right. I mean, there's no reason why by creating a tax on these device networks that we couldn't, you know, finance public goods at the municipal level that directly compete with, say, an Uber as a platform uh, or other kinds of platforms. I, I think, you know, to the extent that we don't create any competition, you know, how do we even have a market? Do you know what I mean? I, 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 so I, I think there's, I think there's a lot of like, I think there's certainly some some merits to the to the question you're posing, but at the same time, though, it's like, well. Gosh, I mean, how are we ever going to have creative destruction if we don't actually create some kind of mechanisms for creating more space for competition and, and recognizing that, you know, again, there's a certain kind of, um, I don't know, asymmetrical relationship that's built into the model itself. May, may I ask Alex a question? Yes. So, Alex, there was an article about a public school district, and I forget what state it's in that is now using facial recognition software and apps um, on all the students without parental consent. And we know that Alexa is, and Siri are collecting data on us out the wazoo. So um, where would you draw the line? What are they entitled to use in exchange for our free use of their exploitative apps? Not to ask a leading question. I would, I would draw the line anything they want as long as we're demanding it for free. But I have apps that I download on my phone that for a very small fee, which goes back to the company, allows me to opt out and shut off the data supply. And I'm saying, why isn't that the model instead of the, instead of the model that it's all their fault and we should be able to I would say social inequality and power structures. Like, how do you mean? Like, right? And those, these are the things that you need government intervention to address. Like, to say that it should, they should be able to do whatever they want because they're offering a low price service is, or a zero cost service, is kind of antithetical to the way we've always done it. Not that that's a good reason, but we must step in when they're not internalizing the costs. Like, privacy costs are real, but they don't internalize them. But see, I disagree, because I think when we impose safety requirements on automobiles, for example, the cost of the automobile to us goes up. We do compensate the person who owns the product for the fact that they are now required to give up things in the interest of social justice. 
in the interest of time, I'm going to say final comments on that question. <laughs> Did you want to respond to? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, well, maybe the price of the car goes up, but the cost of your insurance goes down, right? Like, how do you quantify that across the societal spectrum? I mean, like, and you can game this out in a whole bunch of different ways, but there's, you know, cost-benefit analysis for everything. And while I completely agree that if it's free, if you want to use a service, this is what you're giving up, I absolutely at the same same time agree that there's appropriate regulation. And, and if you want to <laughs> yeah. And uh, like notice and consent doesn't work, and so that's an issue too. And knowledge, people just don't know the downstream effects of where their data is going. So there's a knowledge gap as well that plays and, into all of and, this. And I think it's, I mean, it's hard to speculate what would happen, but if 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 we can agree that there are some particular uses uh, that are socially harmful, and then maybe some of those apps shouldn't be available. And uh, I mean, and, and, I, and I struggle to think exactly which ones. I, Cambridge I don't know. Analytica. I yeah, but Cambridge thing. Analytica. I mean, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll, maybe that's, someone said this morning something like, are we protecting children from child labor? Are we protecting society from child labor, all ch children from child labor from society? And maybe we need to protect society from a bunch of things that are happening at a moment in which actually inequality is at staggering high levels. So there, there has always been inequality. It hasn't been this high in like 100 years. And well, we know what happened then. Um, so, so, but, but it's... Oh no, I'm not, I'm not into political feasibility. <laughs> 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 but no, but it's a great question. It's, yeah, yeah, it's a it's great question. All right, to keep everything running smoothly, I'm going to cut us off there. But thank you all for being engaged. And a final round of applause.